Bushu Hanin. Um, my name is Tanya Talaga. I'm very grateful to be here this evening. It's always good to be back in um, on Algonquin unceded land. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I am going to talk to you tonight about a perspective from Northern Ontario. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about a perspective from the Anishinaabe from Northern Ontario. Um, you see, my grandmother is a member of Fort William First Nation and my, my mother was raised on the traditional territory outside of Thunder Bay on Fort William First Nation's traditional territory. And today I'm gonna to talk about what is an Indigenous city? But I'm gonna sort of unpack that a little bit because to me, perhaps a better question is, what is a city? What does it mean? When I think of a city, I think of a community. I think of inclusion and exclusion, of who belongs and who decides. It is about how we make space and how we welcome others because to me, a city is not defined by buildings, by glass, or concrete, or roads, or restaurants. To me, a city is built by people. It is about people who function as a community for the greater good. It is apparent to me that Indigenous and non-Indigenous people have two very different viewpoints of what makes a city. I'm gonna borrow a story right now, a story from a scholar named John Long. This is taken from his book, a book that I'm actually reading at the moment. This book is called Treaty Number Nine. John Long had a conversation with an elder from Moose Cree First Nation on the shores of James Bay. They talked about inclusion and exclusion. This is what the elder told Mr. Long. He said, when the white man builds a campfire, he builds it so big he builds a roaring fire, blazing away for all to see. The fire is usually so big, people have to sit back, away from the blaze, so they don't get burned. Now, said the elder, when an indigenous person builds a campfire, the fire is smaller. It is contained. It is built carefully, so everyone can sit around the fire and closely enjoy its warmth. Inclusion or exclusion a burning, glorious blaze, or a small fire for everyone to share. As I said earlier, the city of my mother's birth is Thunder Bay. It is a city that I write about, both as a journalist and as an author. I'm gonna explain a little bit to you about Thunder Bay if you're unfamiliar with it. Port Arthur is the white face of Thunder Bay, and Fort William is the red face. Port Arthur lies on the North Shore and it is full of beautiful tree-lined streets with homes with views of Lake Superior. The red side is located down by the Kamenistiqua River on the Uchibwa's traditional lands near the base of Mount McKay. For more than 10,000 years, indigenous people built a thriving society along the banks of the Cam or the Gichigami, which is Lake Superior. Before the white face came to town, this is where the action was as this was the rivers and the, the, uh, the traders used the rivers as highways. They were for commerce and for meeting. But as the railway was built, as Canada expanded and residential schools proliferated in the north, the dynamics changed. You should know that there were 17 residential schools in Ontario, um, two were in the south and 15 of them were in the north. The colonial fire was large and it was burning bright. For a long time, it has been hard to see the small fire. But Thunder Bay is not unique. To me, Thunder Bay can be every city in Canada. Indigenous people, you see, are often caught in a world of not belonging to the society we have been displaced out of and of not belonging to the society that we are forced towards. So when I think of an indigenous city, I think of building a community of belonging of how Indigenous people make their own community in places that we did not build. We build our own city by our community. I think of the community Indigenous people in Thunder Bay have fought to rebuild and have fought to be a part of against so many odds for so, so long. I think of, as well, Anishinaabe Yaski Nation 
a political organization of 49 Northern First Nations. And I think of the hard work that they do every single day to bring about belonging. You can see the people from Anishinaabe Aski Nation, from a territory that's roughly the size of a country of France, north of Thunder Bay, east to the James Bay coast, north to Hudson Bay, and west to the Manitoba border. These are the, these are the nations that make up Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And they all come into Thunder Bay for many reasons, um, for so social services, for health services, to find work, to go shopping. And every single day, the leadership of Anishinaabe Aski Nation, which is housed in Thunder Bay, they work about bringing belonging to their people, to all the people from the north that are coming in to the city of Thunder Bay. And they do this in the face of great adversity. They do this where they see every day, they'll hear stories of their children who are getting pelted with eggs or being called dirty Indians as they walk to school. It is where the daily newspapers run letters to the editors slagging the local indigenous leadership or print headlines making a joke of throwing eggs at indigenous people. It is where an Ojibwe woman, Barbara Kentner, walked down the street only to be hit in the stomach with a metal trailer hitch. When she was walking, her sister, who was beside her, heard one of the car occupants say, I got one of them. But the beautiful thing about the indigenous city that is being created now in Thunder Bay is that everyone who belongs to, to Nan is from far away, they are from those 49 communities that I was telling you about, and they have all come into the city to build a better future for their children. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about city building. This is in Thunder Bay, and this is a, mostly a personal story, but it's a story that I was on with Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Um, and it's about November 1st, 2017. On that day, we held a public memorial for the lives of the seven fallen feathers. The seven fallen feathers are seven high school students who had come to Thunder Bay to go to high school because there are no high schools for them to go to in their own communities. So they have to leave their families, their culture, everything they know at the age of 13, 14, or 15, and they move to Thunder Bay to get a high school education. And on November 1st, we remembered the students that we lost. We walked as a community from Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, where six of those seven students went to school, and we walked down by the McIntyre River. And why we walked on this day, November 1st, was because that was the 10-year anniversary of Reggie Bushy's death. He was a 15-year-old boy from Poplar Hill First Nation who had moved to Thunder Bay to go to high school. And it was kind of a cool thing on that day um, of November 1st, 2017, because on that day, the invitation went out to everyone in Thunder Bay. It was on Twitter, it was on Facebook, that we were gonna do a walk from the high school and go down to the water where Reggie died, and we were gonna remember all the students. And on that day, we walked in a big procession, all of the high school students. Um, we invited the Thunder Bay police, and the Thunder Bay police came. We actually got on loan a, um, a bus from the, uh, the Catholic school board who helped us bus the students back to school after we had made the long walk down to the water. And then we all went back to the school for a traditional community feast. And it was a feast put on by many, many hands. And on that day, we sat together, all of us, and it was a small campfire, and it was inclusive. It was our indigenous city. We invited others to be with us that day. And I really do hope going forward that Canada can join us all. Miigwech.